Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to another show of Career Corner, sponsored by SCAN and the Greater Long Branch Chamber of Commerce. We have with our guest today, Michael Siriani, who's also a councilman at Greater Long Branch and a good friend of ours. And he's going to talk today about the Culinary Education Center at Monmouth University. Welcome, Mike. Hi, how are you? Good. Tell us about, tell us about the, the center itself. The Culinary Education Center is located in Asbury Park. We're on the grounds of Asbury Park High School. It's a collaboration between Brookdale Community College and Monmouth County Vocational School District. I'm the principal director on the Monmouth County side. We have two governing groups that run the school. We have a high school division where we take high school students from all over Monmouth County in their junior, senior year that are interested in a career in culinary arts. And then we have a college division where students register through Brookdale and they can work on either an associate degree in culinary arts, pastry arts certificate, or a culinary arts certificate. Okay. That sounds like a lot. It's a lot. What, uh, well, I guess you could say instead of just picture arts or music as an art, culinary is an art. Culinary <laughs> is an art. Tell me, tell, t well, tell me about that. When you go out to dinner or when you, when you cook, you eat with all your senses. You have your eyes for seeing what you're going to eat. You're going to smell it. You're going to hear it if it's sizzling or, or et cetera. And then, of course, the final one is tasting. So it's always you have to prepare food, uh, keeping those in mind. And then also culinary arts, we uh, different than food service operation is we teach you the reasons why certain things have to be done a certain way in cooking. Uh, whether it's the way things are cut, the food is prepared, the different cuts of meat, different uh, cuts of meat, proper cooking methods, dry cooking methods, moist cooking methods. So there's a lot involved. There's, uh, in baking, it's more science. So you have um, the reaction of uh, flour and water ratio and then the leavening agent to get the cakes to rise or, or to react. So there's a lot involved. So far, you're talking about chemistry. Yes. You're talking about common sense. Yes. Uh, you have to have some sort of management skills. Yes. You have to have math. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you need a so, lot. So, when you when, what are some of the some of the career paths that people can take after when they get after to your they leave, at graduating any culinary school, you do not come out an executive chef. That is a uh, earned um, position title, and that's going to take. Um, a lot of a uh, couple of years to earn that depending upon how aggressive you are but you can end up in a, a management position either a department chef gamage keeper of the coal foods um, uh, banquet chef, a sous chef, What's second a sous, in command. What, 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 what sous, sous chef is second in command under the executive chef. Uh, probably our, our, a production manager uh, in charge of a shift of cooks under them. Um, banquet chef, of course, takes care of banquets, preparing foods for that. Gamage chef are people, uh, those are those that keep the cold foods. So those are the ones that do the large uh, decorative platters of cold meats, uh, cheese, fruit display. Well, you're making hungry, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's very dangerous working in, in my building. We, there's food. Uh, we have uh, three kitchens and two bakeries. There's food all over the place. So you do in-class stuff it, and you do hands-on stuff. Yes. Is that what you do? Each class, each um, uh, kitchen and bakery, you're in lecture from an hour and a half to two hours a day and then you're down in, in the kitchen or bakery uh, for four to five hours. So our block rotation, uh, the students are in for 11 to 12 days, uh, Monday through Thursday, um, and you could be there almost seven hours a day. You got to see, you got to make the dough, watch it rise, and then bake it off. You can't do it. And, and in so how place. much dough do they make working these places? Working these places. <laughs> they vary. That does vary, but um, some um, reports that I have, um, we have students that are coming out working um, uh, high teens into the $20 an hour. Oh, um, is do a number of them go, say, to New York City or Philadelphia or we have City some that, to the bigger cities? We have some that do want to uh, go into the cities. Um, 
not too much Philadelphia, but we do have some that are in New York. Um, and we also have some uh, of our students that own their own places locally. So we're quite pleased with them. Do the students get uh, opportunities to intern at various places? In, if you're in the associate degree program, there is an internship program where they have to do 350 to 400 hours um, interning at a bona fide approved restaurant it's like or 10, food service 10 operation. To 12 weeks? Uh, 10 weeks, 40 time. hours a week, yes. 35 and some to 40 people hours work a week. longer than that, too. Yes. Um, this, what you're talking about is the students who are in the high school or college level. Right. But this is something that people can make their second careers out of. Yes. Uh, on our college side, we had done um, a, a survey where we have about a third of the students at that time were right out of high school going to college picking a career path. Then we had about a third that were um, changing career paths. They had other careers and they always wanted to cook and they always wanted to uh, enter into this field. And then we had about a third that were in the industry, but they wanted that certificate. They wanted that uh, paperwork saying that they were, you know, um, they're bonifying their education. So, meaning they had their own restaurants or, Either, or package and they right. wanted to show that they had some skills. Exactly. Not just what mommy exactly. taught you, but right. or dad taught you. It's right. what, what the school taught you. Some of our career path, we've had people that were IT people um, into computer programming uh, changed over. We've had three police officers who were in the process of retiring. Uh, they came through uh, for a career uh, change. Uh, we've had two lawyers come through that I can remember. I'm going to hold on to that phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we even had a zoologist come through the program. He had his do first degree was being a zoologist, and then uh, he wanted to study culinary. But, but see, now zoology involves animals, doesn't well, it? Well, it's still. So I, I know, but these are dead animals. <laughs> don't want to go into that that <laughs> okay. marriage. Now, now let me ask you this: uh, What, uh, just for the viewers' uh, sake, just give us an example of of the wide range of types of foods like sushi or is it ceviche or is it fish or is it we try to bring steaks we burgers? try to bring everything into the program um, so they start out learning basic uh, cooking skills and the transfer of heat in food production one food production two stock soups and sausage sauces which is the foundation to any type of cooking there is a breakfast class a lunch class menus vary uh, we have two dinner classes. Uh, one is American regional, so that you have a variety of different regions of, of our country with the influences to, uh, it's an eclectic menu. Uh, then the classical cuisine is um, divided between French and Italian cuisine. There is also an international class, which takes all the other countries other than the United States, France, and Italy, so they learn different um, uh, countries, um, uh, traditions, and um, foods popular to that area. Uh, there's a nutrition class so that uh, they also learn how to um, work with different nutritional values in the food. Also, they'll work on carbohydrates one day, uh, diet day, uh, substitutions where they'll make uh, like a morning glory muffin the regular way and then they'll substitute it with apple juice and other things. So we, and then there's a meat seafood cutting class so that they know how to butcher uh, meat and seafood taken um, primal cuts into small steaks. So it's a wide variety. We, we're, we're very busy. Um, and then there's also three dining room classes that they take. So that's, this is on our college side. So, um, and we introduce them to a little bit with the wines. We don't serve, we're a dry campus, but they learn about wines and they also learn about spirits. Um, is there truth to the rumor that it's really tomato gravy, but not tomato sauce, but you still teach it as a sauce? Technically, because it's really technically <laughs> tomato is sauce a is a sauce. So it's a fruit, <laughs> but it's a sauce. A gravy comes from, is a byproduct of the original item. So if you're roasting a beef, the pan drippings mm -hmm. come from the roast, you make a gravy with it. But since you're making tomatoes, it's a separate food product. You, it's a sauce. 
it's a <laughs> sauce. <laughs> You're getting me confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gravy. Well, it's a sauce. The only Italian place I've ever went to, my friend's mother's I, I do not argue. Gravy. If 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 an Italian grandmother turned around and she told me that she calls it a gravy, you know what? You'll Pass the gravy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry. I ain't going up against an Italian yeah, grandmother. Calls, <laughs> I want more of that. <laughs> Well, even there, I mean, you, you must teach um, the students variations of the gravy or the sauce. Yes, yes. There, uh, there's a lot. Um, they've organized everything. Uh, when I was in culinary back in the day, back in the 70s, they were called the mother sauces. They're now called the leading sauces. And they, there's five of them. And then from those five, changing and tweaking different ingredients, adding to them, then you come up with all the smaller sauces. And But the basic um, uh, sauces to know are the basic five leading sauces. You n have those under your belt, you can make anything. See, it's going to be dangerous for some of the viewers because if they watch you on the show before dinner, they're going to really they're stock gonna up. Really watch, so yeah. They probably should watch you after, after dinner. dinner. Well, it depends, yes. on, it depends on the channel itself. Well, one of the things that um, people ought to know about Mike Siriani is that he's also a councilman, as I said before, but he's also a judge in many, uh, many times at, say, a chef challenge that, that say, even Greater Lauren Branch right. has. And how do, you, how do you judge? Going back to color, uh, texture, uh, the food that they're presenting, um, you have to look at, at, the, at the whole plate. And, of course, taste kicks um, is a top priority. You want to see how it tastes, the flavors mingle in, and if there's several things on the plate. So there's a, a, a wide... Um, and everyone's taste is different. I've gone out to dinner even with family members and I've enjoyed it, but yet my brothers might um, uh, not find it as appealing. So Certainly wines are the same way. Wines are, are and your exactly. palate changes your over palate time. Your palate changes. I know when I quit smoking 10 oh, years that, that ago, can that you. way different. Yes. It's not just the food, it's the wine, it's, it's, it's all the different exactly. and the combinations of things. Uh, do you, so in, as far as the even though you don't have spirits on on uh, on campus, campus, you do teach them pairings, though. What things we go well? We teach them pairings, and it's all the um, uh, if we teach anything in regards to alcohol, uh, beer, and wine, it's all theory. And yes, it, it's pairing, but we tell them and then um, assign it as homework so they can go home and work on it. <laughs> Mommy, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the college program. It's the college oh, okay, program. Okay, okay. We don't do that with the high school students. Okay. Um, the, so, if someone were to want to be a mixologist, they would have to go to mixology yes, school. Yes, yeah, not, not, we not do uh, a lot of the um, some of that s subject matter. We do tap into. Um, I know in uh, that dining room class, they'll set up um, a speed bar using colored waters and flavors. They'll uh, give them an idea on how to mix drinks and stuff. But it, it introduces them into it so that they can pursue it if they're interested if they want to. So someone who wanted to do event planning can come to your place? Event planning is very important, though it's, uh, there's a lot more involved to it on management skill right. levels and planning and organizing. But when you need to sit down and meet with someone and discuss menu, um, it would be very good to have uh, uh, food knowledge, uh, food preparation. Um, I was in my earlier careers before I got into this, I was the director of catering for Marriott Hotels. Oh. Um, so uh, I had my business degree, but I also had my culinary associate, and um, that got me through. Thank you very much. Yes. It was very <laughs> interesting. Great. Take it from me. Living with a chronic disease is no easy task, but I learned to better manage my health condition, and you can too. Take Control of Your Health is the chronic disease self-management program created by Stanford University. This fun, innovative course is now offered to all county residents. Diabetes, arthritis, heart disease, cancer. Take Control of Your Health gives proven strategies to manage these conditions and reclaim your life. See how nutrition, exercise, and various mind techniques can help you overcome depression, increase energy, and manage pain. You'll not only get this book when you participate, You'll also receive the guidance and support of others living with a chronic illness, just like you. Take control of your health in six short sessions. 
Call the number on your screen to register or get further information at ScanNJ.com. Brought to you by SCAN, Social Community Activities Network, with funding made available by the Monmouth County Office on Aging. Welcome to another edition of SCAN's Career Corner, co-sponsored by the Greater Long Branch Chamber of Commerce. I'm Len Kicek, and today we're having Nicole Tomlin. Some of you may have seen her in a previous show when she talked about franchise law, but today she's going to show another side of her expertise, and that has to do with HIPAA. I'm sure anybody who's alive, breathing, and um, carries their own insurance would know what HIPAA is, but I'm going to let the expert tell us what it is because there's wonderful careers, technically speaking, and technically it is, in the uh, health compliance area. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Len. Thank you for having me. No, my son always thanks me. <laughs> he says, Mom and Dad, thank you for having me. But anyway, thank you for being on the show. Um, what, is the, what is HIPAA and when did that law take effect? So HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act. The act was put into law in the late 90s and it was put into law to serve a couple of purposes. One of those purposes was to enable employees who were leaving a position to go to a new one or who had had their position terminated to keep their insurance. Is that the COBRA stuff? That is related to COBRA. It's not a Viper COBRA. or COBRA. It's you are correct. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it is somewhat related to that. Now, at that point in time, we didn't really have good regulations in this country regarding how what we now call protected health information is safeguarded and protected. HIPAA was designed to create that framework. Just so no one can steal records or find out personal stuff that they shouldn't find about individuals? That is a big part of it, but it actually goes further than that. Prior to HIPAA being enacted, there were not necessarily standards that were uniform throughout the country. So one might, doctor might do this and another doctor might do that. On top of that, there was an increasing problem with health information being bought and sold. Pharmacies, specifically drug manufacturers rather than like the CVS up and down the street, were going to doctor's offices and they were saying to the doctors, we would like to buy a list of patients from you who we can send a mailing to relating to this drug. That caused an absolute uproar because, for example, Say you were a breast cancer survivor, the last thing that you wanted shipped to your mailbox was information about artificial devices that could make it appear as if you had not had a surgery. If you had high cholesterol or high blood pressure or type 2 diabetes, all of this information was being mailed to your home. On top of that, some of the providers, and not necessarily the physicians, sometimes it was the insurance company that was selling the information, or the hospital, were also soliciting for donations. So if they knew, for example, sorry to continue, okay. that your mother-in-law had passed away from breast cancer, the hospital would send the survivors, anybody who listed that in their intake with their doctor or their hospital, they'd send them a solicitation to fund research or donate to that specific branch of the hospital. So essentially what you're telling me and telling the viewers is that this whole law was meant to protect the privacy of the individuals Absolutely. and not and also to stop unsolicited uh, mailings or, or it, so it became well remember back in the 90s computers were on the scene but certainly not to the, mm -hmm. the extent they are today in terms of speed and storage capacity so what you're saying is that this is a spam preventer, if I could use common new new tech new uh, it, means by describing it. It's a couple of things. It's a spam protector, but it is also something that is designed to help you keep something that is really important to you, that should be confidential to you, confidential. To help prevent it from being bought and sold and traded all over the place. And to enable you to designate if you do or do not want your insurance company to know about something, if you do or do not want your family to know about well, something. Well, a lot of times in, in the health insurance or the life insurance field, you have to disclose all sorts of ailments or prior surgeries because that part is part of their rating. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is what insurance companies are you referring to that you you want to withhold information from. So say for example you are 
a young female and you're going to go in and have a C-section. If you have a C-section and you are a young female, your insurance rate is going to absolutely skyrocket, whether it's a Why? voluntary C-section or an involuntary C-section. Because the chances of you having a second child or a third child and going through a vaginal birth rather than a C-section are incredibly small. So as a result of that, the insurance companies with the changes in the Affordable Care Act are now allowed to charge you more. So one of the things that you can do is you can take a look at the math and you can go, okay, Dr. So-and-so, I'd like to prepay this. I don't want you to bill it to my insurance. I don't want them made aware of that. Okay. And then you can pay for it. And it, yes, it will cost a few thousand dollars, typically somewhere between $2,500 and $4,500 for your entire cost, your global fee. And it's usually a rate that the doctor would normally get reimbursed if he exactly. were to submit it to the clinic. Okay. And then your health insurance premiums won't increase the same way. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Um, how has this law created people or careers um, and, and and compliance officers? How do they get trained? How do they, uh, are all these medical providers, whether it's a billing service or whether it's a, a weight loss service, which we will come to uh, in another show, um, how do they, um, how do the people get trained to, to be in these places and are, are there, enough jobs out there where people, if they were trained, would probably easily find them? So let me answer the last question first. This is a growing field, <coughs> and it is one that is fairly new. It combines a need to understand healthcare with the need to understand IT. As a result of that, there are an awful lot of colleges and universities, all the way from a Harvard to a community college, that will train on this. And I understand that Monmouth University is mm -hmm. looking to expand that with Monmouth Medical Center as is Brookdale. So yes. we have a lot of areas around here that are starting to have show people that there can be careers here. Continue, I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. So one of the things that HIPAA does is it has what's called a privacy rule and a security rule. So the privacy rule says these are the people that you can share this information with. Whether it's you, the doctor, being able to provide the information to your staff in the office or to another provider who's caring for this patient, and that's encompassed within the privacy rule. And then there's the security rule, and the security rule says these are all the steps you have to take to keep this information safe. And they deal with everything from making sure that the laptop computer that the doctor is using to access the electronic medical records, called an EMR system, is safe and secure, and the the files are encrypted and the laptop itself is encrypted all the way through. So you just mentioned EMR. Is there one company called EMR or are there multiple companies that do the EMR work? There are multiple companies and that do the EMR. And they have to be EMR. secure. Yes, they do. And their integration with each hospital, each doctor's office, each nutrition office has to be secure because most of this stuff is cloud-based now. And that has resulted in a huge upswing in the number of technology firms that are working with medical practices because the medical practices are mandated by federal law through the regulations promulgated under HIPAA by the secretary of CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to make certain stuff very, very secure and to handle it very carefully so that when Nicole Tomlin is going to the hospital, my physician, Kathleen Dowling, can go into her EMR and she can enter my information and she can ship it right over to the hospital with a click of a button. But all that stuff requires an awful lot of technology and that is creating a huge influx in jobs. On top of that, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, wants to see that medical practices are complying with not just the security aspect but the privacy aspect. So each medical practice and hospital is supposed to have a compliance officer called a privacy officer. And that person is responsible for updating the practice's plan or the hospital's plan on how they're going to handle security for dealing with any potential losses of information or breach of confidentiality and for reporting back. When, before we started the show and we talked about what, what you're gonna talk about, um, does this law have such teeth that if people aren't compliant, they could be heavily fined or actually put out of business? Very much so. So if an individual breaches HIPAA by, for example, saying, Nicole Tomlin has reactive airway syndrome and it's my pulmonologist and I don't want that information out there, 
I can go and I can call a number and I can report to CMS or to my state agency that there has been a breach of my protected health information. The individual who's made the breach can be fined. If it isn't an individual acting, but a doctor's office, a physical therapy practice, a billing company, or a medical organization like a hospital, then those organizations can be fined as well. I want to run an example by you. I know two people who are named Jim Cook, and one's a realtor and the mm -hmm. other one's a country folk and western star. Um, the, what, were, what would happen if someone were to have the wrong Jim Cook's information sent? happens all the time. They actually have to report the breach. So if a breach is within a certain percentage of a volume of patients, you have to inform the patient of the breach. And if it's a very, very small number, for example, one person out of 100,000, you're just informing the patient. If it gets over a certain percentage, and those percentages change depending on the nature of the institution that has had the breach, then you have to report it to the Attorney General's office as well as CMS. And it's not only the state where the person was treated, but the state where the person is a resident. So say, for example, you are running a hospital system in New Jersey and you have a data breach. A laptop gets lost and it wasn't encrypted properly and it had 5,000 records on it. Now this would be a nightmare for any privacy officer, an absolute nightmare. You have to report it to CMS. You have to report it to your attorney general. And you have to report it to the attorney general in each of the states where any of those people resided. And then you have to report back on the status of your investigation and your attempts to correct the breach to each of those governmental organizations as well as to the person who had the breach. So technologically speaking, it seems that you not only have a mushrooming of compliance officers, but you also must have a whole industry out there preventing hackers from coming in and selling the data or spilling the data out. So you have, um, yes. the NSA may know, but you know, otherwise, uh, yeah, it's, it's scary. It's a little bit scary, but you have to keep in mind that most of this stuff is very, very secure. So unlike our little credit cards where up until recently we haven't had a chip, we've just had mm -hmm. a magnetic strip, our insurance cards don't typically have a magnetic strip. The other thing is you, the patient, are the person that this law is designed to protect. So while there are certainly a lot of people who, who might like to access this information, it's not like credit card fraud where they're going to access the information and steal your money. This is something where the primary people who would be interested in accessing your information are the people who will be penalized the worst if something like that happened. So do you think someday those little chips that are on the little credit cards, your entire life history of medical this, that, and the other thing are going to be right there? And you I just go like this, and the hospital knows everything. I think it's going to be slightly different than that. There's already a path in place, and it starts with something called a patient portal that allows for the creation of an electronic medical record. And the goal, and now this is several years away, but the goal of CMS is eventually to have something where all of the patient's medical records are integrated in one spot and work together. And the idea behind that is if you're treating provider for this and you're treating provider for this, all know all of this information about you. They can work together to create a better plan for your treatment that costs less. Well, and, and, and that's what I was going to get to uh, right, right before, that if you do this, you should be able to reduce health costs because the information is better, the ability to diagnose is better, uh, the ability to prescribe is going to be better, and I think the rehab time will be better. Well, anyway, thank you, Nicole. This is uh, very you. exciting. This is more than a mouthful. Anyway, thanks again, and thank you, viewers.